everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Toxic Mold Sex with Malachi's Message. I'm Elizabeth Kripe. I'm the executive director and co-founder of Malachi's Message. Co-hosting today is Emily Rochelle. She is our board chair and co-founder of Malachi's Message. We are just incredibly lucky. We have a repeat guest today, um, Tim Swackhammer. I think I pronounced that correctly. Um, Swackhammer. Yeah, it's close. Swackhammer. Okay. <laughs> um, he is the founder and the president right now of the Mold Medics. And he last time came on and talked to us about kind of inspections, but what to look for in your home for mold. And today we get to talk about radon. But first, we do want to say thank you to Tim and his organization. They have donated gift cards to help one of the families on our clothing replacement wait list, which is huge. So those families are going to get clothing, which is really big, especially right before school, right? Like that's yeah. a huge deal for parents to be able to give their kids clothing too. So thank you so much. We are so grateful for that. And we're excited that you are now a corporate sponsor. That's awesome. Oh, thank you yeah. guys very much for the opportunity and for all you do. I think it's, it's really huge. I mean, we see... Uh, a lot of the effects of that whenever people are going through these situations. So it's always, always good to see organizations out there to help. Thank you so much. Really. I mean, we, as you know, you've heard our story, we do it because we care not, not because we were in it for any other reason, but so radon is kind of an interesting topic. We're going to talk yeah. about it today. After our last, our last interview, we jumped off the call and we all just started talking and realized that radon is another conversation when you're looking at home inspections and you're looking at mold inspections that is often missed. And it's something that I know when I looked at it this last week that the EPA says there are no symptoms to radon to cause illness. And it was just a very interesting research kind of avenue this last week of going, man, this is another one of those topics that might be a little bit taboo like mold, um, but that looks like it needs to be talked about. So we're so grateful you brought it up and that you're willing to have a conversation with us today. Absolutely. I think it's, I think it's really important. And uh, because of some of the aspects of radon, it doesn't get the kind of uh, discussion that it deserves. And there's a lot of people who just go about maybe having heard of it and not really sure what to think of it. Or unfortunately, there's a, a lot of myths out there uh, surrounding yeah. radon. So I hope to be able to kind of debunk some of those and uh, not looking to scare anybody, but just making sure that everybody understands where radon is, where it comes from, what it does, and what we can do about it. Yeah. Well, in addition to that, I am I found out it's very interesting, but radon, Tim, is it the number one or number two leading cause of lung cancer? Yeah. So it's the number one among among non-smokers uh, and the number two in the country once you include smoking. Can you um because I didn't know anything about radon until I had my own little experience with it, but can you tell people what radon is? Where does it come from and yep. so forth? Yeah, so radon is a gas and it actually comes from the geology in the Earth's crust, the, the uranium that's under uh, that's in the Earth's crust. Uh, as that breaks down, because it's radioactive, uh, it goes through a number of different uh, chemical changes, eventually becoming radon gas. That radon gas naturally migrates up through the Earth through cracks in the bedrock, through different types of soil, through water, uh, all different ways, but it eventually reaches either the air that we're breathing on the outside of the home, uh, or where we get concerned about radon is when it migrates into our homes. And that's where once the, the radon gas is in our home, we basically breathe it in, it continues to decay, and through that radioactive decay process, uh, it damages the uh, tissue in our lungs. So that's where it can cause cancer. <laughs> is it something that, as you're saying, it comes into the house that some people would notice or is it colorless, odorless? Yep. So it's completely colorless, completely odorless. Um, you can't see it. You can't smell it. You can't taste it. You are, our olfactory senses have had absolutely no way of detecting it. Um, it also, as you mentioned earlier, doesn't have any initial symptoms. There's no like, uh, like whenever you walk into a house that has a significant mold issue, you can smell it, you can feel it uh, in your lungs, uh, you can notice that problem there. Whereas a home with high radon levels, you have no idea. Uh, and where radon damage really gets bad is it's like most environmental issues, um, it's exposure over time. So it's that chronic exposure. If you don't test, if you have no idea what the radon levels are, you can be living in a home with high radon levels that are causing severe long-term damage and have no idea. 
And it's pretty easy to test for, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's easier than ever. I mean, there's depend now a lot of this varies state by state because uh, uh, the EPA used to have a lot more uh, national positions on it, and basically uh, over the years that kind of broke down in a lot of the states, particularly the ones that have higher radon levels in general. Uh, adopted their own policies and their own standards, some of them taking them straight from the EPA, uh, others adding to them or making their own, modifying them in some way. Um, and other states, radon is completely and utterly unregulated. Uh, it's just the Wild West. So um, depending on where you're at, like I'm in Pennsylvania, uh, not all the time, but pretty routinely, they have different programs where you can contact uh, the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection, and they'll send you out a free radon test kit that you can test on your own, completely free of charge. You send it into one of their, to their lab that they, uh, uh, they provide you the information with, and they'll give you your radon reading completely free. You don't have to pay anything. Uh, other ones have low cost test kits that are funded by the government. But even if you're paying completely out of pocket, um, the DIY test kits, like I've got one of them here. Uh, this one's from First Alert. Don't quote me on any of the pricing, but it was around, I think, $35. And that included the laboratory fees. Other ones are kind of all over the place, but I mean, under $50, you can have your home tested with one of the DIY kits. That's huge. Yeah. That's so affordable for everybody to go out and test their home right now. And I know, and I know it varies state by state. Like some states have um, a higher chance of having a rate on issue and homes mm -hmm. kind of explain that and why, like, is it more in states where there's mountains or can you go over that? Yeah, so it's, yeah, so absolutely. It's again, it comes down to the geology. It's basically all about what the, the makeup of the earth's crust is underneath. Um, and then also what is the makeup of like the soil underneath your home? So areas that have like a lot of, uh, sandier soils typically where, radon gas can naturally filter up more easily. Uh, they typically don't have as high of radon levels as ones that have more of a mixed soil where you can have uh, bedrock that's higher than it is in those sandier areas. So it really varies pretty greatly, but what it essentially comes down to is for the most part, your Northeast region um, following uh, down the Appalachian mountains and everything, that's all typically going to have your higher uh, averages of radon. Um, and a little bit in the Northwest with most of the uh, Southwest is generally pretty low, um, but that's actually one of the, the big misconceptions that we wanna help address. Uh, whenever you're looking at those sort of regional uh, or statewide averages, it is just that, it's a statewide average. It's an average of all of the readings that they've done or a uh, sampling of readings that they've done. It does not speak to your home's individual rate on levels. And those can vary dramatically from home to home. So even in areas that have lower average radon levels, you're less likely to have an elevated radon reading, but it can absolutely still happen. And it's pretty easy to, to mitigate it if you do have a problem. Yeah, so the, yeah so the mitigation side, um, again, it's going to depend a little bit on where you're at, what type of home you're in, but there is mitigation available for pretty much any home out there. Um, generally, whenever we're talking about radon mitigation, we're talking about a process known as subslab depressurization, which again, so radon's coming up through the earth, comes through cracks in uh, the foundation, and that's where it typically gets into our home, uh, and then it generally will accumulate more in the basement and then slightly less on the next level and less on the next level. Um, so with sub subslab depressurization, basically what we're doing is a pipe is being installed under the foundation or through the foundation of the home that's then being run to the exterior above the roof line uh, and a fan is installed on that pipe. And what that does is the fan's constantly running. So it keeps the soil underneath the slab of your home under a constant suction. So any radon gas or soil gases in general that would be migrating up into your home through the cracks are instead gonna be directed into this pipe because it's under a suction and pulled in safely uh, expelled above the roof line where it can just mix with your normal outdoor air. So it's is a it, very is, effective process. Is it pretty expensive to do that? Yeah. So in general, it's pretty reasonable, especially uh, areas that have a lot of higher radon readings, uh, like Pennsylvania has been doing this for a while. A lot of states it's required, 
Uh, most new construction homes actually come equipped with what's known as a passive radon system, which is basically just the pipe portion. So they won't put the fan on it, but they'll have that PVC pipe running from beneath the foundation up through the roof line. Um, and that's installed whenever the home's built. Uh, if a passive system's installed, it's a very inexpensive process because then we just need to do some tests uh, and typically install the fan, assuming everything was installed properly uh, the first time around. Um, but those installations are pretty inexpensive, generally right around $1,000. Um, and then your full uh, subslab depressurization systems uh, can vary pretty dramatically based on each individual home. So if you think about like a ranch style home where it's all on one level, it's going to be a lot easier than a home that's three or four stories tall, where now uh, there's a lot more pipe that needs to run. There's a lot uh, more complication there. Same thing, uh, some of your older homes don't have the same consistency in building processes. So they can be a little bit more challenging to mitigate. Uh, if you think about a home that was built in say the 1920s, um, they weren't very consistent about how much gravel they were putting under the foundation whenever the home was being built. So sometimes you'll have several inches of concrete slab and then it'll just be clay underneath uh, where you're not able to get a good suction under it. So you, can have, so you may have to do uh, things like multiple different suction pits. There may have to be a change in different fans that we're using. Um, so some of those situations can get a little bit more costly, but I think on the on average, about fifteen to two thousand dollars is about uh, what they tend to run. Um, all depends on the individual situation, but it's not anything completely insane. It's definitely something that is uh, achievable for pretty much all homes. I think that's so important. I've heard so many stories where people, you know, get lung cancer and they don't know why they've never smoked before. And I never knew that radon could actually do that. There was a girl in my area that she was um, just right out of high school and she died of lung cancer. Her parents didn't smoke. Oh, wow. She didn't smoke. Nobody could figure out why. And it makes me wonder about radon, you know, and yeah, hearing the prices. Anything hearing the prices, that's so affordable to just to go get a test and check your house. And if it does have an issue, that's not, that's not that expensive to fix it. Mm -hmm. And especially uh, where we're currently at in 2022. I mean, I'm sitting in my uh, home office right now, which is located in my basement. Uh, and that's the reality for a lot of people. I mean, I'm spending more time in my basement than I ever have in the past. Uh, and that's, that's the reality for a number of people. So uh, with radon levels, they're always going to be highest on the lowest level of the home. So if we had elevated radon levels here, I'd be exposing myself significantly more than uh, when I was every single day going into the office. So that change in lifestyle and the amount of time that we're spending at home now uh, really makes this an even more important topic than it was in years past. So uh, probably what, two months ago, Emily, three months ago? Emily called and she was having her own radon um, potential exposure experience. And I did not know that much about it at all. And so I started to look it up. And are there a lot of misconceptions out there or a lot of myths in regards to radon? Because some of the stuff I was reading was just bizarre. And again, going through it, going, okay, what is accurate? What is just simply like off the wall with radon? Would you mind going through some of the myths or debunking some of them that you've heard? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, there's there are a variety of myths out there, and they come from a, a few different places. Um, a lot of them, unfortunately, come from the fact that it's colorless, it's odorless, you can't see it, you can't smell it, you can't taste it. So out of sight, out of mind, when people can't observe something, they have a harder time actually linking it back to health implications and really identifying it as something real. Unfortunately, a lot of times, it's because you can't observe it, it tends to get associated with snake oil and no, that that's not really something you need to worry about. It's just something people are being sensational about. Um, so it, it's hard for a lot of people to sort of rationalize that. Yeah, I can't, can't observe it, but that doesn't mean it's not real, uh, which is absolutely the case with radon. And uh, that's where a lot of the misconceptions. So first bunch are really about the severity of it. There's a lot of misconceptions about, oh, is it really linked to lung cancer or uh, lung damage? Or is it the, the risks aren't really clear. They're not significant. Um, and the truth there is the EPA has done a number of tests on this. They've been looking at this for uh, 40 plus years. And yeah, the results are 
pretty darn conclusive, about as conclusive as, as you can get in uh, uh, medical science that, yes, there is a direct link between radon levels um, and your level of radon exposure and lung cancer over time. So uh, that's probably the biggest one is just people don't really understand that uh, there is that link and it's very, very significant. Um, the second one's one that we really talked about a lot, uh, radon only being an issue in certain areas. So we hear this a lot, people, again, from, like I said, the Southeast, uh, Texas, those areas that have lower than average or lower than uh, nationwide average levels of radon think, oh, well, it's not really an issue here. And in a lot of cases, they may never even heard of it. Um, but again, because radon is so situational, and the levels in a home can vary greatly just from neighbor to neighbor. Uh, even though the area's radon levels as a whole are lower, that doesn't speak to each individual house. You could still have significantly elevated radon levels in individual homes. Um, one of the things we didn't talk about yet is how much uh, radon levels are influenced by the type of home and the construction of the home. So this is something that a lot of people don't think about, but uh, questions like, do you have a basement versus a slab? Uh, if you do have a basement, is it a walkout style basement or is it completely uh, subterranean? Uh, what type of uh, siding do you have on your home? How are your windows? Are they more drafty or are they most, more sealed? Um, in general, how's the insulation on your home? Uh, all of those things factor into what's known as the stack effect which is basically your home, if you think of it like a chimney. Uh, so air is gonna constantly rise. And basically through the stack effect, our home acts like a chimney. So it's constantly pulling air. Uh, generally our lower levels are under a greater suction. So they're pulling air in, and then that's migrating up through the, through the home. And the problem here is as we uh, build homes in different ways, even neighbors, even if they have the exact same soil underneath, just based on the home construction, one home could be exerting a much greater suction on the soil around it, which is going to pull in more soil gases, including radon gas, and lead to much higher radon levels. So it's really, really kind of crazy. Uh, and that ties to one of the other, and this is by far the biggest misconception we hear, is, hey, my neighbor tested for radon. They didn't have a problem, so I probably don't have a problem either. Uh, and that's, I, I understand the logic there, but in reality, it couldn't be any further from the truth. Um, to to kind of drive this point home and really help inform ourselves, uh, we did a little test in my neighborhood and we tested uh, five homes all on the same street uh, with a maximum of like two houses apart from one another. So it's a newer development, development um, all built within I think, three years of one another uh, and all of the homes within probably 200 yards of one another. So nice, fairly tight grouping. Um, and the radon levels we found there were, uh, my, the lowest was actually my next door neighbor came in at 2.6 picocuries per liter. Uh, and two houses down from him was 15.9. So all over the place, because the, uh, the EPA action level for radon is four picocuries per liter. That's generally where they say, uh, above four, you should have a mitigation system installed and get it down. Um, it's not necessarily saying four is the safe level, but four is the level where they definitely recommend that be done. Um, and ideally, whenever you're doing mitigation, we wanna try to get it below two, uh, depending on most homes, that's a realistic goal. Um, but again, going back to the survey, I mean, we were, uh, one was 9.6, one was that 15.9. Uh, mine was right on the borderline, I was 4.1. We had, uh, and my next door neighbor on the other side was 13.8. So literally all over the place with homes that are very close in construction style built by the same builder. Uh, what was also interesting is only about half of them did the builder install a passive mitigation system. Why that was the case, I have absolutely no idea how they made that determination or what went on there, but uh, it was really, really quite interesting just to look at the a lot of the assumptions that we make whenever we're talking about it and how completely false they can be and just how situational it really is. What are some other symptoms that people, people could have because of radon? So really it comes down to the, the main big one is lung damage and lung cancer. So whenever you talk about symptoms, 
These are going to be things that are going to develop over time, but it's going to be a lot of your kind of standard respiratory issues. It's going to be uh, coughing, wheezing, shortness of breath, um, those type of problems. And talking about it in relation to mold, uh, one of the big issues here is all of this damage is cumulative. So it's just the longer you're there, the more exposure you have, the more damage it's going to cause. Uh, and it's making your lungs weaker over time, which is what makes you more susceptible. Um, I don't have the stats on it in front of me right now, but uh, smokers who also live with radon are at significantly higher risks of lung cancer because they're damaging their lungs via smoking and they're damaging their lung lungs from the radon. Uh, so those two kind of piggyback off one another. And same thing very much can be true with mold damage. Uh, if you have lungs that are damaged from radon exposure, it's going to make them that much more susceptible to other damage, including mold. We're going to take a quick pause. I know we have a few more questions because my brain is now racing, but we need to quickly thank one of our corporate sponsors. <laughs> All right, today we are thinking biotechs, mold, inse mold inspections and assessments. They are out of the Fort Worth, Dallas area, and they are one of our tier one sponsors. They're incredibly close to being a tier two sponsor, and they've been with us from the beginning. We are so grateful for Kyle at Biotechs and everything that he's done to work with us. Biotechs, mold inspections, and mold testing is one of our tier one sponsors. Their professional mold inspection, mold detection, and mold testing services ensure you're doing everything you can to protect your health and property. It's important to them that you have the best experience, which includes protection against conflicts of interest. This is why Biotechs does not perform mold remediation and why their inspectors are licensed by the Texas Department of Licensing and Regulation, or TDLR, as mold assessment consultants. To learn more, you can visit www.biotechsinspections.com. I, I, I have a question. Yeah. When the EPA set these standards, you know, because back when we grew up, when we all grew, I don't know how old you are, Tim, but, you know, in the 80s, I spent most of my time outside, you know, yeah. and, and nowadays with technology, I mean, kids, I never see them really outside. Everybody's inside. So when these, when they were setting these standards for exposure level of four, were they taking into account the amount of time now that people mainly, like they say, like 90% of our time is spent indoors today versus, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. back the 80s. Yeah. So as, as far as I know that uh, the radon EP or the EPA action level for radon, that four pickle carries per liter has not moved since it was initially set. So there's, yeah, that you're absolutely right. Same thing with like the work from home situation, the amount of time kids are spending in homes um, that has not been considered in terms of, uh, how much more exposure there is versus when, yeah, we were kids and playing outside and all that. So that's definitely a very, very good point because again, it's all cumulative. It's all about the exposure over time. So, I mean, if you're a kid that's growing up in a home with high radon levels, again, a lot of times you're playing in the basement, you're playing generally on the lower levels. Um, so you can have a great exposure over a very, very long period of time. Um, and again, the, uh, whenever we talk about exposure levels, a lot of people think that acute exposure or like being exposed to very, very high levels is where problems come in. And that's really not the case. Uh, where most damage comes from, it's not somebody going into a place that is an insanely high uh, 50 or 90 picocuries per liter. That's generally not where the damage is coming from. It's living in a place that's at 15 picocuries per liter and living there for 40 years, 20 years, 30 years. Any of that really, really long-term exposure where it's just constantly causing that damage, uh, that can be very, very significant. I mean, for, for reference, the, uh, uh, the risk of cancer exposure uh, for non-smokers living in a home at 10 picocuries per liter is 20 times greater than the risk of dying in a home fire. So we think about all of the different things that we do to prevent home fires, whether that be smoke detectors, fire suppression systems, uh, all of that and all the different things we do there to prevent that from happening. Uh, but your risk, risk of getting cancer is significantly greater from radon. At, and again, that's at 10 picocuries per liter, which is not 
at all an unheard of number. Wow. I, you, you made me think of mold when I re- mentioned fire because I remember reading a stat about how mold destroys more homes than fire do per year. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I mean, unfortunately, a lot of the, uh, it goes to a lot of the issues with raising awareness about environmental problems. Uh, your big giant issues that come up, your house fires, those things, they grab a lot of the news headlines. They tug at our heartstrings, understandably so, um, because it's such a everything was normal. This event happened, and then you can see all the fallout afterwards. Uh, but whenever we're talking about environmental issues, there is that no big one turning point that we can point to or the media can point to and say, look at this event. It's stuff that happens over time, and it makes it harder to, harder to recognize and harder to measure. But that doesn't make it any less real. Is there, you know, I'm thinking of people that are building their homes. If, is there a way that they can like look up and see if they are in a a area that has a higher probability of having a radon issue? So when they're building their house, they can go ahead and have that system installed. Yep. Yeah. So, I mean, for one, I would recommend every new home install a passive mitigation system. It is very, very inexpensive insurance, basically. Um, I mean, you've got uh, not a long install on that. And uh, depending on the height of the house, a few things of PVC pipe, um, it's really not all that complicated to, and the rest is stuff that you should be doing in normal home construction anyway. So they're really pretty inexpensive um, to do during new construction. The other benefit uh, is typically when we do a, a full installation on a home that doesn't have a passive system, the radon fan, we try to run it inside whenever we can, but we've got a ton of two-story homes and trying to find a place where you can put the pipe inside where it's not going to be some giant eyesore uh, going through multiple levels of the home like that can be very, very challenging. So uh, they end up going on the outside of the home for the most part, which one downside of a, a radon mitigation system is whenever they are on the exterior, uh, it is a bit more of an eyesore because you have basically the fan on the outside and you have the, uh, the pipe or uh, some people or some companies do use downspout uh, material as well to route the gas up. Um, but either way, you're adding more not aesthetically pleasing, pleasing items to the outside of your home versus if you do a passive system, it's all internal from the outside of the home. You can't even tell because all you see is typically on the backside of the home. There will be just a boot with the PVC pipe sticking up out of it, out of the backside of the roof. So uh, there's very, very little visual evidence that there's anything going on there. It's a much less expensive, much easier install to do. Um, so every home should be built with one of those. Um, to your question about the, can you look it up in any way? Uh, again, unfortunately, this comes down to what area you're in specifically. The EPA does have uh, some lookups where you can look up. I believe they go by... Um, I know they do go down to at least the state level. I can't remember if you can look any more. You might even go to be able to go down to county level there. Uh, but like, for instance, the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection, uh, you can go on their website. And uh, as testers, we have very strict requirements for reporting our tests and reporting our mitigation installs and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so you can actually go on their website and look up by zip code what the, I think they do, the average uh, radon level within that zip code, as well as uh, the highest rate on level that was uh, tested in that zip code. So you can get some good information there, which could help advise that. But again, it's just cheap insurance. I, I'm a very strong advocate that if you're building a new construction home, just install one. It's going to be cheap and easy. And uh, unfortunately, until the home's actually built, because again, your siding choices, your window choices, all of that has such a great influence on the overall rate on levels, you're not going to know what the levels are until it's actually done. What are some of those better options? So it honestly, it doesn't, it's more about just all of those influencing it rather than any individual building material being better or worse. They all have pretty significant uh, uh, benefits and drawbacks on other elements too. So I wouldn't really let that uh, influence the decision in the materials that you use other than just know like, uh, one of the big issues we see, again, in terms of misconception, if they've had their home tested once, they think they're good forever. 
And in general, you're pretty good until you do something to the home that could significantly influence that stack effect. So let's say you had your home tested and you had older windows and you got the windows replaced with newer energy efficient ones. That's going to dramatically change how air flows through your home, how much pressurization there is on the basement, and can very much impact your radon levels. And even things like siding, a new roof, uh, new insulation in your attic, all of those things could, could influence that. So anytime you have any of those sorts of major home renovations, that's a good time to have your home retested. Would you, would you wait like six weeks to test or would it make a difference? It's really the, the levels normalize pretty darn quickly. So, okay. I mean, after a few days, you should, should know once the work's actually done, you want to make sure that everything that needs to be caulked is caulked and everything's painted and uh, you're actually completely done with it. But once you, once you're completed there, uh, that would be a good time to test. Now, the one thing I do want to comment on the testing too uh, so these short-term test kits and everything are going to uh, at least get you in the ballpark of what your radon levels are in your home. So they're inexpensive. They're great for that. They can give you a very good idea of where you're at. They're really not the best method if you're uh, if you really want to know what your actual exposure is. Because again, there's so many different factors that can play in, and one of them is weather. So depending on the different seasonality that you have, are you running a combustion furnace or your air conditioning? Do you have the wind? Typically in the fall and spring, you'll have windows open more versus winter, it's more closed up. You've got more combustion appliances running. All those are gonna influence the stack effect as well and can change your radon levels. So really there's a variety of different long-term test kits that are available as well. And again, these aren't terribly expensive. They're not as common because most radon tests are done in conjunction with a real estate transaction. So that's why we see a huge plethora of these short-term tests, because uh, if you tell a realtor that you need to wait 90 days to sell a home so you can have a 90-day radon test done, uh, their head's going to explode, understandably so. Uh, so that we don't see those kind of long-term tests anywhere near as frequently as we should, uh, but those actually give you a much better understanding of the overall radon levels in your home, because they can fluctuate greatly season to season, month to month. Um, so ideally, if you can do a full year one, that would really be best. Um, and to that point now, thankfully, in the age of technology, uh, AirThings is one of the companies, and there's a number of other ones that are coming out with more of these uh, smart home devices. Uh, and some of them are integrated in with other air quality sensors. So they may measure carbon monoxide levels. They may double as smoke detectors. Um, but there's a number of different indoor air quality devices now that can also give you uh, radon measurements, both over the short term and over the long term. So. I really recommend those to anybody who has uh, any kind of like borderline radon level. So if they, they get it tested, maybe it comes in at three. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean you're in the clear because it could be that the seasonality or uh, any of those factors were influencing it. And yeah, that test came in at three, but if you look at your annual average, it's actually six. So those devices can be good to help identify how is it over a longer period of time um, and also, once a mitigation system has been installed, um, I, the EPA recommends once you have a mitigation system installed, you should still retest about every other year uh, just to ensure that everything's functioning properly. Because now we're the downside with the mitigation system is we are introducing it's a mechanical component. So, I mean, bearings fail, fans fail. Uh, and really, one of the most common things that we see, especially in older mitigation systems, um, the mitigator tied into whatever power source they could find. And then somebody else did some work on the home. Maybe they added uh, fans in an upstairs bedroom or something like that. And they altered the power source that the radon fan was tying into. And now it's working off the kid's bedroom light switch. Uh, weird stuff like that can happen. So that's where having it tested um, occasionally afterwards can help make sure that you're, you're keeping it at safe levels. Is this something that insurance touches? So if a family is in a home and they find that out, is this another one of those things that insurance isn't going to touch? Not, I've never heard of it being touched at all. Yeah. Um, maybe some home warranty providers um, would be the only thing I would think of, but even that I am completely guessing. One of the, the other big misconceptions that we hear is uh, they've been in their home for a long time 
So like sort of the, the argument of the damage is done. I've been here for 20 years. Doesn't make sense to bother getting it tested now. It's just not true. I mean, you've been damaging your lungs for that amount of time with the radon levels, but if you know that the levels are high or if you've had it tested or even if you haven't had it tested, now's a good time to do it because you're going to be there for longer. The sooner that you can correct that problem, get those levels down, the less damage you're going to do to your lungs and the less likelihood you're going to develop cancer over time uh, and the safer it's going to be for everybody in that home and anybody who moves into the home after you too. That, that is, um, that, that's a very good point. I've met some people that kind of, you know, have that same philosophy and it's like, wait a second, do you want to get worse or do you mm -hmm. want to stop, you know, stop where you're at now? Like, let's say that you don't get worse, but you stay the same. That's better than getting worse. Like just fix yep. the problem. And this problem, the radon issue, mitigating it, that's not that expensive. No. you know, compared to a lot of other things that insurance doesn't touch, such as mold. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think, I think that this is such a very important test and it's very inexpensive to do, and you can do it very quickly. And, and if you do have the issue, you, you can fix it most likely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, there's very, very few, few homes, if any, that can't get below that four pico curies per liter. Again, we're trying to get down below two whenever we do mitigation. Um, for the most part, that's very possible. Uh, and it's something that absolutely should be done. At least test, at least know where you're at so that you can make an informed decision going forward. Uh, don't kind of, like a lot of people tend to do, don't just bury your head in the sand on it and say, well, if they're bad, they're bad. And we'll deal with that later because you don't, you don't want to be dealing with that later. It's a lot less expensive and a lot easier to just do the test, figure out if you need a mitigation system, go through that now and not have the damage over time. Well, thank you. Seriously, thank you for bringing this topic up. I know it was a new topic for me. It was something Emily and I talked about almost a few weeks before you had approached us with this topic. So we're incredibly grateful for you being willing to discuss it with people because I know it's probably a new topic for a lot of our listeners. Yeah, no, no. I, I really appreciate you uh, lending your platform this way. I think it's very important information that people should know, and especially uh, people who are suffering from uh, mold or other environmental problems. Uh, it It's all connected. I mean, homes are a system, bodies are a system. We can't just isolate and say there's only this one problem that we need to deal with, and these can all influence one another. So this is definitely something that uh, don't be blindsided by. It's easy to test. It's easy to fix. Just got to do it. Oh, 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 oh